Good morning. Um, I'm going to make this introduction a little personal. Have you, any of you ever felt like you were always in someone else's shadow? Well, I work around and with and for Bob Bond ever since he joined the laboratory. And he casts a, a very long shadow. Um, he's an expert, nationally re recognized in open systems architectures, embedded uh, high performance processing, signal processing systems, and um, um, uh, many, many other areas of expertise, including artificial intelligence. Uh, he was, until recently, uh, the associate division head of our ISR and tactical systems division, uh, led by Bob Shen, and uh, in which many of uh, the staff members uh, and instructors are, are in that are teaching you in this course. Uh, but recently, he was named and accepted the, the position of our chief technology officer at, uh, at Lincoln Laboratory, where the entire lab benefits from his direction about our internal uh, research funds that we can apply to many different technical areas, including some of the most forward-looking work and autonomous systems that we do at the laboratory. Um, the personal part is, if any of you bought, brought a, a chess board, he's also a chess player. Um, but I'd like uh, all of you to help me in welcoming Mr. Bob Bond. Uh, so good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ken, for the, for the gracious introduction. Um, let's see. Uh, maybe we should start with a, with a nerd joke and see if you guys get it. <laughs> so um, have you heard the one about the, uh, the two antennas who uh, decided to uh, get married? Well, so, oh, you heard it? <laughs> what you speak quite about it. So uh, apparently the, uh, the marriage uh, ceremony was nothing special, but afterwards the reception was fantastic. <laughs> so, so, there, there are about 20 or 30 other jokes like that, but I'm not going to tell them today. <laughs> and so you don't have to thank me. Later on you can thank me. Um, but anyway, so I'm here to talk a little bit about autonomous systems and sort of what we see as trends and challenges in that area. Uh, but I thought I would start out by asking you all, you know, so what is an autonomous system? And uh, have you thought about it? I mean, you're all working in autonomy and autonomous systems. But have you thought about what defines an autonomous system? Anybody want to? Yes, sir. Basically, uh, reacting to one environment using and how does that distinguish it from, let's say, a good answer. I mean, that's sort of along the lines of, uh, uh, of where I was thinking. But how does that distinguish it from, say, any software system, or any system for that matter? Yes? So it doesn't always know what its input is going to be, and it has to be able to do something, even though you can't actually tell up what's going to happen. Good, good. Yes? No human input. So it's all based on what the system so like having a human stuff. OK. Close. Uh, it's Get. a system that uh, accomplishes a task without real time human input. So it's all the algorithms already planned out before Great. So I think so. these are all great answers and are all along the lines of, uh, of what I wanted to bring out, which is if you think about it, at the heart of an autonomous system is the notion, of course, of autonomy, and what is autonomy but the ability to act on one's own, right? So an autonomous system really is a system that we've designed, that we've vested the responsibility for making decisions into the machine and taking it necessarily, therefore, away from the human. But by the same token, um, you know, are there any truly completely autonomous systems? So can you think of any system that runs totally in and of itself without interacting with the outside world uh, in some collaborative way? Yes, over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so even humans, in some sense, uh, so we might think we are uh, autonomous, right? And to a large degree, we've been given a lot of decision authority. But we also conform to uh, societal rules, and we also interact inside of a society. So in my view, even though uh, a human 
could be thought of as an autonomous system, and I think perhaps the, the foremost autonomous system, it still is interacting with an environment in a way that's a collaboration, which in that collaboration can be viewed as the societal contracts that we have. So I'd, I'd, I'd put forward to us as we think about where the next iteration of autonomous systems is going to be, as we make uh, computer systems and robots more and more intelligent, um, I think that soon they stop becoming tools that we just use, and they start to become almost peer entities that we uh, uh, interact with, just like people interact with each other. And so even though we may think of these systems as becoming more and more autonomous, and in fact they are, they're also rising up into a broader uh, responsibility to work in a teaming environment or a societal environment. So as you, as the next generation of engineers and scientists are thinking about what you're going to be building, I'd ask you to keep in mind that as you build it, uh, and as it becomes more and more capable and more and more intelligent, that you should think about how it's going to integrate with the broader society in which it's intended to operate. Uh, so with that as, a, as, a, as, a, you know, as an introduction, um, what I'm really going to do today is just give a very brief overview of autonomous systems, a little bit of a historical perspective. Then I'm going to take a step back, draw you a block diagram of, a, of an autonomous system. It's going to look like very much like a block diagram for almost any system. But you, in the middle of that will be artificial intelligence that is really the driver for autonomy. Then I'm going to give you an example, uh, a system called Perdix, which I believe for many of you, you may have seen the presentation from uh, Dr. Eric Evans, uh, I think it was last week, and I think he showed a video on Perdix. I'll show the same video, or a similar one. I'm not sure exactly which one he showed. Uh, but I'll point out, as we go through it, where the real autonomy challenges were and the engineering that went into building out a system of that sort. So autonomous systems, uh, it, it, you know, the. The imagination of autonomous systems and the implementation of autonomous systems goes back a long, long time. And I've subtitled this chart Brief History because I could really spend the rest of the lecture briefing this history. But I don't really want to spend the whole time on this. But I really just want to point out that even back into mythology, people were thinking about autonomy and autonomous systems. And in fact, one of the things that I highlight here is um, Greek legend about an uh, automaton called Talus, who uh, was created by the god of craftsmen, sort of the ultimate engineer of his day, uh, Hephaestus. And uh, his job, Talus's job, was to guard the island of Crete. So if anybody got too close who was uh, an adversary, got too close to Crete, he would throw huge boulders at the, at the ships coming into the island of Crete. It turns out that. Uh, he got tricked by a sorceress whose name was Medea. She, she convinced him that all he had to do was remove this little plug in his heel, sort of his Achilles heel. In fact, some people think it was a forerunner to the legend of Achilles heel. Uh, and um, remove some of this uh, liquid that was flowing through his body, which was the lifeblood, basically, of, of, of the uh, automaton, and he could become immortal. Uh, what it did instead was he. He bled to death. So <laughs> he was not the smartest uh, automaton, maybe, that we've built. Um, so anyway, way back at the beginning of mythology, we've been thinking about automation and, and robotics. Does anybody here know where the term robotics comes from, by the way? Yes, up there. You're thinking first. So close. Um, so Isaac. So the term robot itself, so maybe I didn't phrase the question exactly right. The term robot itself comes from a play. The play is uh, written by uh, the, uh, the playwright uh, Carol Capic, and it was called uh, Rosam's Universal Robots. So he was the very first guy to introduce the notion of robots. But Isaac Asimov, as you pointed out, was the first person to really invent the term robotics as a field of study. And uh, so that was back in, I think, roughly 1940, 1941. And ever since uh, um, we've started to build capable computing systems, robotics has taken off. 
uh, and uh, um, places like uh, MIT in around the uh, 1950, not, sorry, 1960 time frame uh, actually stood up AI laboratories and robotics laboratories, Stanford as well, um, University of Edinburgh across the sea, and a little later Carnegie Mellon Robotics. So we just, the idea, the imagination just got fired in this area and we've since then just invented many, many new technologies and today, uh, you know, if we look forward all the way in, into, uh, into the modern era, uh, there are companies coming out, of there, uh, coming out that are creating all sorts of robotics creations. AI is taking off as an industry. Um, commercial uh, autonomous drones, and you guys are all learning a lot, or many of you are learning a lot about drones, um, are really beginning to proliferate and becoming a hugely, uh, hugely popular commercial entities. And of course, there was Sputnik as well, which happened around the uh, late 1950s, which was the first uh, satellite that was launched in space autonomously, uh, circling the Earth. Uh, the laboratory, Lincoln Laboratory, has been involved in creating the uh, uh, capabilities for building out autonomous systems and robots since the very inception of the laboratory. But uh, the real point of this view graph is to show the real enabling technology of computers. And how, I mean, I'm sure all of you or most of you have heard of Moore's Law. And this is just an illustration of Moore's Law, the exponential increase of computing capabilities. Shown over here, if this works, is the Whirlwind computer, Whirlwind second version of it, which was a digital computer using the first uh, uh, magnetic core memory. Um, and it was used to, uh, to do real-time calculations of trajectories uh, for, um, for missiles and to figure out, uh, or for aircraft coming uh, that needed to be intercepted. So this would, is capable of doing real-time computations, first computer of its sort. It could do 20,000 operations in a second, and you measure its size in tons, basically tons of compute. <laughs> Today, as you are well aware, you know, in about 100 grams, we can get a teraflop of computation. So, you know, over a 65-year time period, the capabilities have grown so tremendously that now the ideas that we've had about autonomous systems and robotics can actually find their place in the implementation in, in uh, real computer systems, which has been one of the enormous enablers. If we look today, we're seeing what some people have coined as a, as a Cambrian explosion of capabilities. Uh, so a little... Uh, more history, but this is prehistory. So back in the Cambrian era, uh, as some of you may be aware, it was a time when um, life forms on Earth just exploded in their diversity. And the question that, that uh, um, we ask ourselves is, so how did that happen? And many of the hypotheses center around, well, suddenly there was a, uh, an abundance of oxygen in the seas, and so the organisms could find a fuel source, oxygen, which allowed them to then compete in their environment. And soon they realized that it might be more effective if I actually went and ate the other guy. <laughs> Instead of just trying to get the oxygen myself, I'll get his fuel source. And so uh, the idea was that around this era, um, we developed you know, sort of a, a, an ecosystem where you know, we were starting on the huge thrust of evolution. And so, in some sense, uh, folks who are working in the autonomous systems area have, uh, have said, we're in a similar age now in robotics and, and artificial intelligence. We have this uh, confluence of computing capability, access to uh, big data, huge data sources for training our algorithms, and finally, uh, algorithm sophistication that can be matched to, the, to those data sources and compute capabilities. So this chart just shows some of the things that have gone on in the last year or so. Uh, it's about a year old. I haven't updated the chart. One of the, one of the things that I like uh, is one of these uh, most recent um, robots from Boston Dynamics. It's called the Spot Mini. Have any of you heard of that or seen that? Right, so you know, one thing you may not know about it was, uh, and if you look at it there, its head is very stable, right? Its body is gyrating around the head, and they took a, uh, um, chickens as their inspiration for the design of the control system for this. 
So if you take a chicken, apparently, and the guy sort of showed me a movie of this, and if the chicken is fixated on some food, so you put some food there, and he'll be looking at the food, and if you take his body and you do this with it, it just keeps staring at that piece of food. And so they actually analyzed the motion of how he keeps his head so stable looking in that one direction. And the reason they did that was because they wanted to build a, a robot that could do uh, manual tasks around, around the house, and, but so it could walk over things and navigate and, you know, and not kick over the beer bottle in the corner or whatever while it was trying to hold something steady or do a task that required it to have very, a very steady face. So its face is actually uh, also its gripper. So, so they took their, uh, their inspiration from the chicken to build this. Um, on the bottom line here, I'm actually showing what we call sort of autonomy at rest, which is really artificial intelligence applied into uh, all of the things that aren't robotics, but are you know, hugely benefiting from, from autonomy. And one of them that I'd like to point out, so how many people here know how to play Go? Do I have any Go? Wow, that's a lot. Good. Well, so I don't have to explain to most of you about the game. It's a very simple game in terms of rules, right? I mean, you have the black chips and you, or the black coins, and you have the white ones, and you, you have to surround one with the other, and then you win what you've surrounded, and it's on a big grid. So the rules are simple, but the game playing it is enormously challenging, and it can become extremely complex. And people were hypothesizing that um, computer systems, which had already mastered chess and could beat the world's best chess players, were still decades away from being able to, uh, to beat the world's best in Go. But it turns out that just this last year, um, the, a program developed by Google called AlphaGo by Google Mind uh, beat one of the world's best Go players. And it beat it using uh, what I'll talk about in, in a couple of charts some of the fundamental enablers in AI technology today. And so you'll get a feeling when I talk about that, about where we're going, where the trends are, and what the potential is for AI. So I asked earlier, what is an autonomous system? And so in one way of saying it, is, this is kind of a circuitous definition, but an autonomous system is a system that's sort of recognizably near the autonomy frontier. And so what I mean by that is, is sort of countervailed by um, Tesla's theorem, which is artificial intelligence is whatever a machine hasn't done yet. So as we know, as we get used to the capabilities of a, of a computer, we take them for granted, and it no longer seems so intelligent. So in some sense, our, you know, autonomous systems that are employing artificial intelligence are the systems, the ones at the frontier are the ones that we view as the autonomous systems and the ones that are just doing the rote sort of tasks that we've now called rote, we just think is automation as opposed to autonomy. And a couple, there's a couple of ways of looking at autonom autonomous systems. And one of them is to compare in, in, a, uh, in a graph autonomy versus complexity. So I might view the environment and the task that a system is supposed to complete in that environment uh, so that's the role I've given the autonomous system. Um, and then how much independence have I given that system to carry out its role is the degree of autonomy that I've vested in it. And you, know, you might think that a remotely piloted unmanned air vehicle, some people call that an autonomous system. But really, if you think about it, it's not that autonomous. It's being driven by somebody else. Now, just because the pilot isn't situated in the machine, uh, doesn't mean that the machine suddenly is autonomous. It's actually its decisions are being made by a human. So its degree of external control is very low, even though it might be operating in a, in a very uh, unstructured environment. So it's not quite on the autonomy frontier. At the, by the same token, you might have a machine that's, that's um, flying waypoints, a drone that's flying waypoints on its own. So you've given it a lot of authority. You say, go fly these waypoints and figure out how to do it in whatever the weather is. Um, but the waypoints structure the environment for it. It's not making very many decisions. It's just flying here and then here and then here and then here. So what we're trying to do with our autonomous systems is we're trying to recognize where this boundary is. We're trying to push it forward. We're trying to push it into regimes where we can't uh, go today with, with, with our current AI software and autonomous systems. Another way of looking at it is, is performance versus complexity. 
So in that same uh, environment along the x-axis, but I'd have performance of the system along, along the y-axis. So in that context, I could think of something like chess playing or uh, go playing systems. So that we're really working in very static and predictable environments. The rules of go are very simple. The rules of chess are relatively simple compared to the rules of life. Um, <laughs> and if you can figure those out, please come let me know. Uh, so you know, you'd say it's a static and structured environment, but they can outperform humans. The human limit has been reached in that static environment. At this other extreme, there are autonomous systems that can't operate, and they rely on humans to help them operate. So what we would really like to do, again, is take the autonomy frontier and move it beyond the human limit, maybe working or ultimately working collaboratively with the human in order to deliver performance that a human could not do on his own or on her own. So you might ask yourself, you know, in an abstract way, what are the benefits of autonomous systems, especially for national security, which is the area that I work in, for protecting our nation. And um, a couple spring to mind, and you probably, if I had canvassed you, you would have come up with these. But one of them is, or one dimension is the range and access dimension. If I don't have a human in a, in a, in a machine, then that machine can last longer. It doesn't need to take into account all of the requirements to support the human. Um, also, it may have access to places that are not accessible by humans, um, send it out into space or into the deep, uh, into the oceans, or into dangerous environments. Scale and agility. So, you know, often operating at very large scale. So if you have to manage multiple things as a human, you run into a limit and, you know, after a handful of trying to coordinate multiple things, but a computer can coordinate potentially many, many, many things so it could scale to much larger systems. And it can respond more quickly, so in many instances. So if I'm under a cyber attack, which could happen in microseconds, a human will not know, will not have the time to figure out what to do, but a machine could detect that and respond very quickly to uh, essentially thwart that attack. And then there's performance versus cost, or performance and cost. So eventually, you know, we can think of humans and machines teaming across missions and across different scales of operation and working much more effectively than either the machine or the human would do uh, um, on, on, on their own. But also, machines can also aid human-human interactions. So just a machine that makes it easier for people to work together also is a, is a performance-enhancing dimension. So there's a whole bunch of things you can imagine in the, in the military autonomy world. And I want to take a step back here before I walk through these. Um, so it's a little frightening to think about giving autonomy to military systems. I, you don't want weapons or you don't want the Terminator type of scenario to, to emerge, right, obviously. Um, so in the military, there's... Uh, a lot of concern about that. So what do we do when we're trying to build smarter and smarter systems? Uh, what's the role of the human? So the human always has to be in a critical position to, to ultimately be able to control, especially life-death situations. And so that's part of the challenge in building out these autonomous systems. But there's a, a broader global issue here, which is uh, that's the perspective of, of the United States. But who's to say the terrorists would have that same perspective? They may not have, and we know they don't have, the same moral compunction as we do. Or even other countries may not have the same view of the rules of engagement for autonomous and artificial intelligence systems. So one thing that we need to do for national defense is we need to think about what the other guy can do as well. And we need to be working uh, to uh, understand the potentially bad uses or, or unethical or immoral uses of autonomous systems and AI and figure out how we're going to be able to, um, to counter those. And I think that's a very important thing for us all to remember as we're building our autonomous systems. So then stepping back into the view graph here, there are a lot of places where we're seeing today uh, autonomy and AI emerging. And one of them is in the command and analysis centers, just using AI to do a big data analysis of, of, and decision support types of applications. But we're also looking at applications where 
You may have, uh, say, a pilot and then other autonomous assets that are working as wingmen around the pilot and, and working with the pilot to carry out a mission. Or a human and robot collaboration to do something such as a, a search and rescue mission. Um, we're thinking of systems of systems that are, some of them are autonomous systems, some of them are, uh, um, are, are human systems, some of them are unmanned systems controlled by humans but have a large degree of autonomy vested in them. We're also looking at, and this is uh, where you saw the other day, Perdix. We're looking at miniature and swarming systems that can be launched from all sorts of different uh, venues. Um, and then, let's not forget that underpinning all of this is the cyber domain. And as we reach out into the Internet of Things, we're actually vesting more and more autonomy at the sort of at the edge of our internet. And so these are all areas that have military significance. And as we, as we think about these, you know, the bottom line is autonomous systems and artificial intelligence really will end up over the next decade and going forward as being um, critical enablers for future war fighting and national security uh, applications. Um, so I want to take a, you know, a little bit of a turn here and talk about, so where are the trends? <clears throat> and I told you I was going to show you a, a picture of an autonomous system. Well, this, this is sort of a very high level, and you can draw certain, you know, many other types of uh, renditions of an autonomous system. This is one. So, of course, it starts with taking inputs, observations, and it ends with taking actions. You know, whether those actions are a robot walking or whether it's a machine giving you a advice about doing something. Uh, it, it all has to do with interacting with the environment. But what's at the heart of an autonomous system is the software and the artificial intelligence that drives that software. And then at, you know, at the heart of the heart <laughs> is the decision-making capability that you've vested in that autonomous system. Um, many systems today are very sophisticated because they build sophisticated views of the world and they have a world model against which they're comparing their decisions and then extrapolating what uh, impact their decisions will have on that view of the world. And then after having made that decision according to the goals of the system, executing a certain set of behaviors. But we mustn't forget that, as I said before, these systems, especially as they become more uh, intelligent and we invest more autonomy with them, in them, will have to interact more and more with human operators or other autonomous systems. So the whole communication loop here and the interfacing to the human is also extremely important. So if we look at where the drivers are, and I kind of alluded to some of these already, uh, compute power has really been the fundamental driver, the exponential growth in compute power, which is colloquially known as Moore's Law, but also the availability of huge amounts of data. So this has been a fundamental enabler in our commercial world. Having data that's been labeled so that we know what the truth is for that data has a huge impact on machine learning algorithms. We can now uh, train our systems um, over huge data sets, and we can actually depend on the data sets to inform the algorithms about the structure of the world, as opposed to trying to code really, really sophisticated pieces of software. Instead, we can let the data of the world tell the software what the structure is out there. And that's kind of at the heart of many machine learning algorithms. So the algorithms themselves are now being, becoming more and more sophisticated as they exploit uh, compute and data. And then in the robotics side, of course, we see a huge amount of, uh, of, of improvement in platform technology, new materials, uh, batteries, additive manufacturing, being able to 3D print something. And then the connectivity and the increase in communications capabilities that just allows much more sophisticated interactions with the world and collaborations. So if we talk a little bit more about artificial intelligence and in, for the interest of time, I'm just really going to focus on one area, which is deep learning. And I'm sure, so let me ask, so all of you, you all know what deep learning is, yes? No? Oh, okay, good. So I'll briefly summarize it with, just a few words. Um, so many deep learning algorithms boil down to really uh, a hierarchy of a neural network <coughs> algorithm. And it's the observation is made that you can actually train these algorithms 
uh, such that each subsequent level or layer in the architecture uh, moves from the uh, perception of basic objects to more and more sophisticated objects so that at the end of the pipeline, you're actually doing an, a, an identification of a very sophisticated object or a very sophisticated pattern of behavior or a very sophisticated um, uh, decision-making process, dot, dot, dot. So here's where I just wanted to talk about what makes AlphaGo go. So uh, there's a very nice paper written by the folks who, uh, who devised this uh, uh, sophisticated algorithm. But if you look at it, if you boil down what is the heart of, uh, of AlphaGo, it really comes down to these three areas that we've already talked about. It comes down to access to data, supercomputing support, and then advances in algorithms. And what this chart shows is on this axis here, on the, on the vertical axis, is what's called the ELO rating, which is a way of rating how good someone is at a game. It's actually named after a guy whose name is ELO, who came up with this uh, rating initially. And shown along here are different programs that have been developed over the last decade or so. And AlphaGo is in blue. And AlphaGo distributed on a computer is in dark blue. And Fan Hui was a European champion that they, they gauged this against. And then Lee Sadol was the world champion or world caliber uh, player that they played against. So if you look at it, AlphaGo, without the computing support, uh, but access to a huge amount of data, uh, was able to play pretty well, about on a level of, of Fan Hui. And how did it do it? Well, um, first of all, AlphaGo, as we mentioned with the big data uh, area, had access to 160,000 uh, games uh, that were played by experts in the six to nine Dan uh, level. And so it could initially have this tag data set that showed it what a good game was. And so it trained itself initially on this 160,000 uh, game data set. But then, once it, so, it sort of thought it knew what a good game was, what they did is they played it against itself. You can create a whole bunch of alpha goes. So they played against themselves and then developed strategies for beating itself over and over again. And as the best strategies emerged, those were used as the training weights in the system. So this was done using two different uh, neural networks. They had a value network that was 13 layers uh, that said how good a position was and a policy uh, network, which was 15 layers, which basically was telling uh, the system, uh, where should I go next? How should I navigate through this very complex uh, um, uh, go uh, player space or move space? And they used a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm in conjunction with these neural networks to prune the data space that they had to search through. So a lot of algorithm sophistication, access to a huge amount of data. At the end of the day, though, it's problematic, or you could argue that it wouldn't have beaten the world's best if it didn't have access to huge computing power. So the computing system uh, that reportedly they used uh, had 1,200 CPUs and 176 GPUs working together. And then when they played Lee Sedol, they actually uh, substituted in the Google Tensor Processing Unit for even more compute power. So in the back room, there wasn't just one brain working to beat Lee Sedol. In some sense, there were uh, literally hundreds of brains, hundreds of computers working uh, to, to beat the human in this case. But we can do that with computers. So that's the insight into where uh, AI technology is going. Again, I'll reiterate, access to training data and then being able to generate your own data sets from that and using self-learning in some sense. Algorithm advances in deep learning, and then uh, huge computing support. In national security, so I keep coming back to national security because that's my job, um, there are additional challenges. One of them is that w whereas the, most of the commercial world is really focused in um, one, two, maybe three dimensional data, say video and text and algorithms and, or video and text and, uh, um, and audio and, and, and algorithms that combine those. Um, 
the military world, there are many other modalities that have to be combined. Uh, there's uh, radar, sonar, um, uh, um, IR sensors. There's all of the other sensor data that the, the rest of the commercial world has. And also, in the, in the military context, the availability of truth data, labeled data sets, can be rather sparse. The, the adversary isn't going to tell you necessarily the information that you would like in order to program your systems to work against the adversary. They're going to be a little secretive about it, right? So we're in a regime where we have what we say is uh, relatively low or scarce availability of truth data and very, very high dimension data. And this puts us in a regime where many of the algorithms that work very well in the commercial regime do not work well at all. And so one of the real challenges is adapting those algorithms adding to them and understanding where their deficiencies are to adapt them into the military context. Um, so I'm, I'm going to speed through a few of these just in the interest of time, but I'd like to point out that there's huge uh, um, advances that are being made in platform technology. In fact, you know, if you just take a look at the types of systems that are being built today, the, the, the diversity and sophistication of the platforms is enormous. The um, capability per cost and per size is growing exponentially. Uh, the mechanical intelligence, just the uh, sophistication of the, of the materials and the, um, and the mechanical side is also growing just as quickly, really, as, as the AI capabilities, and they're being integrated together very tightly. Uh, so you see that trend. Um, manifesting itself in, you know, the commercial market for UAVs is sort of literally is taking off. Um, but there are platform challenges, and I'd point out that the probably the biggest challenge in many platforms is power and uh, long endurance or uh, energy systems that can endure a long time so that you can do significant missions, for example. Uh, you know, in, uh, if you're inside of an ecosystem where you can fly your drone and then plug it in and repower the battery, that's fine. But if you're in a military context where you don't have access to a, you know, to a power grid or whatever, the ability to have a battery that lasts not 30 minutes but three hours becomes really important and critical in enabling those missions. And the other, the other point I'd like to make is having a, a, a new platform doesn't necessarily equal a new mission capability. So the overall integration of all of this capability together to meet a mission requirement in a sophisticated package is still a huge challenge and, and one that's a huge opportunity for everybody here, for example. The other two points I'd like to make really quickly are um, in the overall system engineering of an autonomous system, a huge problem is system verification and validation. So as we build more and more sophisticated software systems, of course, it gets really difficult to test those software systems. In fact, one of the rules of thumb for people who've worked in the software industry for a long time is that uh, if you haven't tested your system, it's only half done. So half the work is in, is in the testing side of it. But now imagine the additional complexity that a machine learning piece of software brings to the problem. Imagine that you have a system that once you've built it and you deploy it into the field, is actually going to change its behavior. So now you're in the situation where not only do you have a huge software system to try to test in the first place, it has perhaps an unbounded behavior space. So how can you even test that? You can't. You have to develop new approaches to gaining trust that that piece of software, that AI, that autonomous system, is going to do what you intended it to do. So you, we have to rethink how we test systems as we vest in them more and more autonomy. We have to think more about uh, they're at a peer relationship with us, and, and we have to develop a trustful interaction with them, and how do we do that? So it's a whole new game when we start thinking about the verification and validation of, uh, of autonomous systems as they become more and more autonomous. The other area is human-machine interfaces. Making a lot of progress in this area, but there are a lot of challenges. One of the you know, easy challenges to articulate is size, weight, power, and cooling of interfaces between humans and machines still needs a lot of work. Um, 
But there's, there's a more profound challenge, although that one's a big one, which is um, when we build a system that we're supposed to be collaborating with, we need to have, in some sense, some understanding that that system understands us, that we, when we make a contract together, that the contract is mutually understood uh, between the two entities. So there's a lot of research going on into AI systems where they are trying to learn what the human is thinking, in a sense, and figuring out, therefore, how to interact with the human. And so this is a real trend and a huge research opportunity as, as we try to make machines think more like humans so we can interact with them uh, you know, in, a, in a more trustful and, and, and uh, um, effective manner. Also, uh, though, there are machines that we're building today that do learn from observing humans. And I'd just like to point out over here this helicopter flying upside down here. Uh, this is something that Stanford built. And uh, what they did is they had experts uh, who, flying helicopters uh, that, that, that this, uh, this uh, AI system observed. And on the basis of watching these experts fly through very complex maneuvers, this machine uh, was able to uh, emulate that behavior in an average sense and then uh, in an average but uh, optimal sense. And so now it was capable of flying those same maneuvers better than the best experts were capable of doing it. So having machines learn directly from humans in that way in, for control systems, as I'm sure you've heard about, uh, is, is a huge step forward and another huge research area and trend. So I'm going to close off here by, uh, by showing you uh, Perdix. And so Eric Evans, Dr. Evans mentioned Perdix when he talked to you uh, last week. Uh, it turns out that uh, um, this has gotten a lot of news. It's been in 60 minutes, and a lot of people have seen uh, uh, um, what we've done in this area. This project started as a, as a student project. So we, uh, we came to MIT, where they're you know, the, some of the brightest students in the world, and we said, hey, can you build us a system that uh, folds up and fits into, could fit into a little canister, as, as you're seeing there. And then we launched the canister, and then out of it, we are going to launch this UAV and have it fly off and do something. So that's pretty challenging mechanical engineering and also giving enough smarts inside the system so that it understands how to do that properly. And so they went off and they, did, they came up with several designs and eventually settled on the design that's sort of shown up in the upper uh, right-hand corner there. It's about 12 inch long, 12 inch long system. Uh, and uh, we uh, subsequently took that, and we were using 3D printing that, you know, because you can rapidly uh, iterate through designs, uh, but ultimately we ended up with a molded uh, um, uh, approach to building out it just for the manufacturing. But that's a, a little bit of a side story. But anyway, we took this, we built several hundred of them, or a few hundred, and we put in them the capability to operate autonomously once they were launched. And autonomously, in this case, means we'd give them very high-level commands. And on the basis of those high-level commands, they would self-organize and figure out what it was they uh, needed to do to carry out that high-level command. And in fact, if um, one or more of the um, uh, UAVs, one or more of the drones in that swarm, of which there was about 110 in the, de in the video I'm about to show you, were to fail, the rest of the drones would figure that out and figure out how to cover for that failure and regroup to still carry out the mission that was, uh, that was given to it. And so I'm not sure exactly how to play this. Here we go. On center line, entering containment area, clear arm. Okay, we're armed. Um, so at the start, I'm, I'm sure Eric went through some of this, we had three F-18s, each of which is launching a, uh, a Perdix drone about every point, point three, point, about every third of a second until we get over 100 of them out in the, out in the environment. Sorry for if it's a little loud. And you can't see it here. Castle 3 1, two pods armed. Castle 3 2, two pods armed. 3 3, one pod armed. 5, 4, 3. Mark. 
Up in the upper right hand corner is a zoom in that shows if you look carefully you can see these little black dots coming out. So those are the Perdix uh, drones coming out about every third of a second. As I They actually come out in those canisters, and the canisters descend, uh, and they have parachutes, and then the uh, Perdix uh, drones launch out of those canisters and figure out which end is up, literally, and then they uh, um, fly according to the high-level command that they've been given. So what you're going to see here is the flight path of the F-18s this way, and then all the drones being deployed along that flight path. And the first thing they're going to be asked to do is sort of form a wall on the left. And so they figure out by communicating amongst themselves uh, how, to form that, uh, how to form that wall. Oh, and one more thing. So the green is where they are, and the red is initially where they think they should be. So when they first come out there, they think they should loiter around until someone tells them what to do. So they figure a loiter point, and they, and they move around that. So here they are kind of loitering, but then very soon they get told, OK, guys. Um, we want you to go and form a wall. And so they, they say, OK, we'll form a wall over here like you told us. And they fly over to the points that they've decided each of them should go to. There could be a couple of them that fail. And so they have to figure out, uh, the whole swarm has to figure out what to do about those failures. And then we tell them, OK, now you've got a wall. We want you to fly to a certain point and then stop there, fly around for a little while. Now, you can imagine they could do much more sophisticated missions, but this was just to show that they could work as a, as a, a full team together to do maneuvers. But while they're maneuvering, they could be, be doing all sorts of other things that you could imagine. Now, um, we told them to form yet another wall. And then we said, OK, we want you to fly around in a tight circle. So this is where the 60-minute crew was. And so we wanted to surround the 60-minute crew. Uh, and uh, just show that we could uh, zero in on a certain spot and, and uh, um, in a tight formation. So we initially did that. And then we decided, after we did that for a little while, that we would do something even more bold, which was like, let's converge on those guys and, and really scare the willies out of them. So, So we told them to fly in tight formation around this one little spot where the, where the crew was. And then I think next you're going to see kind of what the crew saw, the, the filming crew saw. And so it's a little bit like being in the middle of a bee swarm. Or if any of you have seen the movie, the Hitchcock movie, The Birds, which is a little before your time, where all the birds in this county uh, start rebelling against humans and flying around and attacking them. It's a little bit like that. And so all of these guys are flying autonomously, trying to avoid, uh, trying to do their mission uh, while not uh, you know, running into each other. And so that was kind of the end of the, of the movie. And um, so that's sort of the end of my talk, too. So one, a couple of things I wanted to point out about that, that uh, apart from what I pointed out as we were walking through it, one of them is, so that's a, an example of distributed autonomous system, right? Each of those systems, even though it's autonomous in and of itself, is working in a larger distributed autonomous context, which is somewhat like a society, right? We all have our jobs. If we were a football team, we'd all have our roles to play. It's the same sort of thing going on here. So there's autonomy, but it's within the context of a broader mission. And so as we go forward and build our autonomous systems, you all, the next generation that's going to build these systems, remember, these systems always should be built in the context of a larger mission. And uh, keep that in mind, because these systems will get smarter and smarter, and they will have to integrate with the broader society, which is all of us. So that's all I, I really have to say. I won't walk through the, the summary points, because I've given those points already. So thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? So, 
I, I believe we have time for a, a couple of questions. I know I ran a little late, but if there are any questions. Yes, yes. Uh, how do we deal with uh, autonomous vehicles and autonomous robots like breaking down and not working on like, the Paradigm drone um, and not getting in the way of other functioning autonomous vehicles and other people? Well, so, the, so it's a good question about, you know, so how do you do like basically collision avoidance, right? Um, there are a couple of, so this is a huge problem in air traffic control. So if you look at traditional air traffic control, there are collision avoidance systems, which actually use very sophisticated AI to figure out how to avoid. So some of that technology is being migrated into, uh, into drone technology. Um, but also, there's work going on where you can build into the system ideas of keep out zones and keep in zones. And, as, and so you have the autonomous system control system. And then outside of that control system, you have this other entity watching the control system. And as it gets close to the boundary, it goes, hey, hey, come on, pull yourself back in. Or if it gets uh, outside of the region that it was supposed to be flying in, it goes, hey, you're getting close, start pushing you know, start pushing the other way. It's the same thing as if you were navigating a, in a corridor in a, um, in a race car. And there's algorithms for pushing you back in a graceful way from the, from the edges of the, of, of the race course. So those technologies are being developed as well. Uh, yes? Uh, do you agree with Elon Musk's recent controversial statement that uh, AI is the greatest threat to humanity? <laughs> well. Um, as Spider-Man said, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. And I, I or maybe he was told that. But, um, but, but basically, AI is enormously powerful. So it brings with it dangers. And we have to manage those dangers. And I think if you got anything out of my, uh, my talk, it was the tone that we have to be careful about how we build our systems so that we actually integrate them into society and not actually have them on the side of society and in some sense posing a threat. So it is a challenge. I don't think it's going to be one that we can't manage, but I think it's one that we have to manage. Uh, yes? Do you think like, with AI being more complex, like, it can get to the point where they, like, they start developing like, uh, more of a priority of themselves and like, the and stuff and, like, and taking more of the human race? So, so that's a similar question to what I was just asked. I, so first of all, I think we are a long ways away from what, uh, I, what I've been describing is what's characterized as narrow AI, right? And then there's broad AI or general AI, uh, which is what many people are afraid of, where the AI entities become more intelligent across the full spectrum of human activity than humans are. I think we're many, many, many years away from that. And we may not even get to it. We may find there are fundamental limits. For example, um, the brain is still so much more efficient in managing power. We can, we can fit so much computational capability and use just a handful of watts. We are orders of magnitude more sophisticated in terms of our compute capabilities as an engineering feat in our brain than anything that we're building today. And we're probably uh, also reaching the limits of Moore's law, where we can't actually build much more capable computers using our, our current approaches. So it's not clear to me that um, the compute power is just going to be there in the near term, uh, and the compute power per watt, or per energy efficiency, to allow us to build systems that really challenge humans across the full spectrum of what humans do. So I think it's a long way off, but I think it's a question we should be dealing with today. Because it may seem a long way off, but then things have a habit of accelerating once you reach some kind of key capability point. We haven't reached that capability point yet, in my view. The machine learning that we've been seeing uh, is very capable, uh, but it also has a lot of restrictions. I mean, it uses big data. It can't uh, do one-shot learning, for example, which is like, if I see something just once uh, as a human, I recognize it very quickly. Machines still have a lot of trouble doing that uh, because they're based on this idea of they'll figure out the world from huge amounts of data. 
So there are things that humans do that machines still really can't do very well at all. So there's still a lot of uh, research to go into that. But we are moving in the direction where machines are getting more and more intelligent. I just don't know how far away it is. And I think between now and then, the conversation about how to integrate them into society in a non-threatening way is an important dialogue. It's an important aspect of the whole problem area. Let's join again in thanking...